might we carry out multidisciplinary work in the pandemic world that we are living and in the post-pandemic world we are emerging into? Welcome to my presentation. My slides are color-coded. I hope it makes it easier to follow remotely. You can use the color-coded sections to guide you to the parts of interest. It is challenging to do multidisciplinary work because it involves sailing to unpathed waters on drained shores. As the Winter's Tales Camilo puts it, while navigating territories where one may be seen as an outsider, it is even more challenging to do so in a time of hate because students and readers often bring our racial and gender identities to bear on the work we do creating superficially positive and sometimes negative association. A scholar of Asian descent, for instance, may be expected to write about Asia or Asian America in a particular way. Conversely, those who work in marginalized fields are compelled to explain their work's relevance to more dominant fields. This is a form of ghettoization caused by institutionalized racism that disciplines one's identity and research output. My talk today is divided into two parts, multidisciplinary research and pedagogical practices with a particular focus on performance studies. Each part delineates five unique challenges and suggests solutions to them. We live in a time of hate. And hate is a product of social silos that parallel academic disciplinary silos based on periodization of subject matter. Multidisciplinary work, therefore, can be one solution to hate because it builds bridges. For all my life, I've been looking for a place to call home. As an immigrant who engages in multidisciplinary work, I have received a number of labels and I've called myself a few. I have been seen as a Shakespearean, as an Asian studies scholar who work across performance genres and film studies, as someone who is expected to represent minority communities in some context, and as a digital humanities educator who brings critical race and gender studies to bear on each other. I'm now based in Washington, DC, where I'm still conscious of my positionality as a diasporic subject in my teaching and in my research. I never feel quite at home in any department anywhere because I'm often the only non-native speaker of English in the room and the only person who grew up outside of the US. Multidisciplinary scholarship catches things that may otherwise fall through the cracks between established fields. In fact, since our students come from different backgrounds, our students are themselves multidisciplinary, which calls for multidisciplinary pedagogical methods. My work does not fit in any single, singular disciplinary home because I teach performance studies in the English department and examine cinematic representations of theater in a theater department. My focus on ephemera is a misfit in English departments where most scholars work with printed texts and codex books. In East Asian studies, theater is a marginalized site and I approach performativity from a cultural studies angle. Now, still looking in from the outside, I embrace my marginalized positions, which enables me to have a bird's eye view of issues in a time of hate. In this presentation, I want to share how I have evolved as an educator and as a scholar, how I learned not to turn foreign shores into home turf and lose my edge in a comfort zone, and how I both passed through and sustained the transitory spaces in my writing. While interdisciplinarity often involves the transfer or fusion of methods between disciplines, Multidisciplinary projects are situated at the crossroads of disciplines, either because the subject matter is itself multidisciplinary in nature, or it can be best understood through multiple perspectives. 
I would like to offer a case study that captures the challenges of multidisciplinary research across historical periods and performance genres. The immediate challenges include speaking effectively to multiple audiences and being persuasive to single disciplinary gatekeepers, such as granting agencies. Now, um, I would like to ask you to think about your own approaches as we look at the case study. Which discipline do you think would be the most useful starting point and which other uh, methods might you uh, bring to bear um, this case of a Korean film about theater? The film follows a pair of Korean street performers on stage and off stage Jen Sung plays macho roles, and trans-feminine Gongji takes on Yodongmo queen roles. Gongji presents as feminine off stage. So in Lee jong blockbuster, The King and the Clown, these three characters that enter into a kind of triangle relationship uh, the film came out in 2005 and marked a new milestone for transgender performance. It brought gender nonconformity into public discussion in Korea. Essentially, it delineates a kind of 12th night inspired love triangle with this king, uh, a male jester, and a trans woman who shares with Ophelia the inability to express oneself in a world largely determined by men. The two actors travel from town to town as part of the all-male Vegabang theater, known as Nam Sadong Nori, a United Nations intangible cultural heritage. Alluding to the Taming of the Shrew, Gongji plays a rude coquet, while Jan Song's character attempts to tame her. Whereas Gongji creates a character of femininity on stage, Jang Song walks behind random women off stage. And Jang Song sways his hip in an exaggerated fashion to mark the feminine gate, despite them being uh, sharing a very close bond. So as you can see, there are many themes going on at the same time here. Performance studies scholarship has generally ignored the King and the Clown as an instance of mediated representation of historical Korean theater, while film scholarship has interpreted Gongji as a character within the gender binary. The film invites fluid interpretations of how one's body relates to one's social roles across historical periods. Depictions of gender nonconformity are enriched by the game some enactments of gender by the play within the film. The King and the Clown, however, has been misunderstood by performance studies and also ignored by queer studies. Asian and Western critics misgendered the trans woman in the film and misread the film as a gay romance between two cisgender characters. The film appeared on the heels of South Korea's first regulatory revision concerning gay rights. So it's understandable that a lot of attention has been paid to that aspect and, and the assumption that this must be some kind of allegory. In fact, the film is part of a growing group of narratives with overlooked trans aesthetics they have remained marginal even to queer scholarship because of the tendency to map what seems uncategorizable onto what one already knows. So what is assumed to be uncategorizable would be ambiguous genders, where gender nonconformity and the better known movements are gay rights, um, and the better known uh, the better known genre is actually straight romance. Beyond the question of disciplinary assumptions lie the twofold problems in trends and performance studies. Representations of pre-modern theater in general and East Asian transgender performance in particular is an underrepresented area of research. At stake here are forms of marginalization based on both the temporal axis and the geocultural dimension. So the temporal axis would be pre-modern theater, 
and geocultural dimension here largely refers to non-Western theater. Theater is an overlooked site of cultural meanings, and there's even a critical bias within trans queer studies that favors modern Anglophone texts. Multidisciplinary researchers face a number of challenges. First, restoring a long view of history can help us understand how we think about the present. Jack Halberstam has promoted perverse presentism, a methodology that uses history to denaturalize contemporary articulations of gender and sexuality. The two um, the films, uh, the film The King and the Clown here, uh, can be seen as a form of Halberstam's perverse presentism. The director used a kind of historical safe distance to the pre-modern period as a screen for engaging contemporary gender issues. The early modern gender ambiguity enables our contemporary cultures to give some of the characters and a more a uh, flexible inflection in the art of becoming their new selves. This, of course, connects to other problems. It's not simply about how to read history or whether presentism is a valid method to deal with historical material. In fact, uh, we're also dealing with symptoms of power knowledge structures. When the production and dissemination of knowledge favors and supports Anglo-Eurocentrism, it creates disciplinary silos that obscure long global histories. They render non-Western knowledge less relevant. To solve the problem, we can examine similar cognate cultural phenomena such as cross-gender casting across extended periods of time and locations. This enables us to draw conclusions from global patterns. Details we learn in the long durée in comparative theater historiography would be very valuable, uh, and in fact, as valuable as the singularity of any one given event. Equally problematic is the tendency to regard the global and the local as politically expedient, diametrically opposed categories of difference in an often unarticulated agenda to preserve a literary elite. The global is imagined to be whatever the United States and Great Britain are not. This phenomenon has contributed to the tendency in English language scholarship to assume that the global refers to cultural realms beyond the US and UK. As Rosella Ferrari writes, scholarship treats Asian performing arts as active producers of original epistemologies rather than merely uh, as providers of ethnographies or derivative adaptations. That really should be a goal that we strive for instead of subsuming um, non-Western, non-white uh, knowledge to, uh, to, to, to footnoting white theories, we should treat them as producers of original epistemologies. The next problem is one of compulsory real politique, basically the conviction that the best way to understand non-Western works is by interpreting their engagement with in pragmatic politics. This approach may impose intentionality on directors and imply that their works are of the interest only because of the testimonial value. The approach runs the risk of turning world theater into mere curiosities of colonial remnants. Performance creates varied pathways to dramatic and cultural meanings across history, but polity-driven historiography has constructed linear, synchronic narratives that have been flattened by national profiling. So basically, national profiling has a tendency to characterize non-Western artworks based on stereotypes of its nation of origin. Compulsory realpolitik combined with Anglo-Eurocentrism, leads to the habitual privileging of the nation state as a unit to organize knowledge. Studies often bring national political histories to bear on non-Western theater forms. Theater works that do not appear to be resisting Western hegemony are then ignored. Anglo-European works are assumed to have broad 
theoretical applicability, and aesthetic merits. While Korean theater, for example, is compulsorily characterized as allegories of specifically Korean issues. Critics are on the lookout for potentially subversive political messages in non-Western works, even when they focus on artistic innovations. As a result, non-Western artists are compelled to prove their political work. There are a number of implications of this approach, which isolates performances in their perceived cultural origins. It could miss the rich intertext between different traditions. It could imply that works from the global south are valuable only for their political messages rather than their aesthetic merits. The story of non-Western works is not and should not always be political, though the Western media often gravitate towards stories of political dissidents. Of course, stories of political oppression must be told, but the economist's views do not get us very far. The disciplinary silos in turn impose the uneven burden of multidisciplinarity on scholars working in marginalized fields. They have to explain the relevance of their work to those in dominant fields due to the current structure of academia and hierarchies of culture, cultural prestige. Asian studies specialists, for example, have always been obliged to know their Sophocles, Shakespeare, Moliere, Ibsen, Anglo-European critical theories, and so on. Scholars of Western theater tend to regard knowledge of Asian directors as the responsibility of those who specialize in the subfields. The European-American norms have predetermined what is worthy of scholarly interest. According to this view, the aesthetic meanings of such performances are either indecipherable or uninteresting. Ray Chow observes, despite the current facade of welcoming non-Western others into punitively cross-cultural exchanges, there's still, quote, a continual tendency to ghettoize non-Western cultures by way of ethnic national labels. This institutionalized bias has put the burden of multidisciplinarity on minorities. For example, in order to communicate the importance of their work, Asian studies scholars often adopt a comparative approach and write about how Asia fits into the hegemonic Euro-American history. The fetishization of political merits and the nation state could unduly emphasize non-Western genres alleged deviation from Anglophone practices and in turn instrumental, instrumentalize the global for the purpose of diversifying the scholarship and curricula in the UK, US, and Canada. As a result, works by non-white authors are imagined to fix their intellectual content by way of a national ethnic or cultural origin. Western white examples are assumed to be more effective in their explanatory power, while African, Asian, and Latin American materials are recruited to serve as the exceptional particular. Non-Western artworks have been put to uses in the larger discourses about their role in the order of things, in the hegemony of whiteness. There's actually a flip side of this problem, namely the expectation that one's racial identity matches one's research subject. Let me quote an anecdote offered by Madavi Mena in her book, Indifference to Difference, which is a version of what I have frequently experienced myself. When Professor Manang arrived at a border control at an airport, the immigration officer quizzed her on her profession. Upon hearing that Manang taught English literature, the officer asked if she specializes in Salman Rushdie, only to be surprised by the fact that she was a Shakespearean scholar. Because she was Indian and held an Indian passport, the officer assumed she should teach Indian writers. At times, she has been asked if she, quote, worked on Indian authors who travel out of India. Because the immigration officer wanted to know about traveling Indians from a traveling Indian. Madame concludes 
that, quote, despite being motivated by a desire for difference, this thirst for knowledge decode in advance the parameters with, with, within which the difference could be known and disseminated. The racialized discourse manifests itself in post-colonial studies as well. Post-colonial studies tend to focus on British colonialism and Anglophone colonies. Countries that do not fully align with the narrowly defined colonial experiences such as South Korea uh, or even Hong Kong have been neglected. The transcultural and transhistorical dimensions of multidisciplinary work can expand the purview of post-colonial studies and decolonize the study of non-Western cultures and of the white canon. Having realized that disciplinary boundaries are erected and patrolled by gatekeepers who need them to validate their own authority, I have learned to work with rather than out of the gap between disciplines. Tools from various disciplines help us catch things that may otherwise fall through the cracks between the established fields. To counter dominant assumptions driven by the power knowledge structure, I adopt a rhizomatic approach to intercultural and transhistorical performances that capture both the divergence and convergence of cultures. Asian divergence from Anglo-European norms is often accompanied by convergences or a melange of people, motifs, and dramaturgy. Specifically, Deleuze and Guattari use the botanical metaphor of rhizome to describe multiplicities as opposed to an arborescent model of knowledge, which is hierarchic like a tree. A rhizome provides nonlinear friend species connections in plants. A rhizomatic network of knowledge captures multi this multi multiplicity more effectively through non hierarchical entry and exit points in data sets and their interpretations of culture. It reevaluates the perceived lack of connections between Western and non Western works. We can connect what may otherwise seem to be isolated instances of artistic expression. We now turn to pedagogies, extrapolating lessons from multidisciplinarity to serve our students. The time of hate we live in dictates that we answer collaboratively the challenges of all forms of violence, including racism, anti-Semitism, misogyny, and transphobia. In a time where the classroom is subject to new forms of subterfuge, secret recordings, and professor watch list, it is all the more important to bring our academic work to build more equitable communities rather than exploiting trendy topics that service academic advancement and not serve community members. Multidisciplinary pedagogy addresses the needs of multidisciplinary college students. They come from all majors across the campus. With the vocabulary of different disciplines, not only can we shed new light on the subject matter, but we can also build more effective bridges to different sectors of the society and different styles of learning. Teaching during the global pandemic and multiple protests against injustice against the world I've come to realize that despite the enormous emotional labor, multidisciplinary approaches provide a very path to knowledge that ensure that students treat each other with respect and dignity in online discussions. In what follows, I would like to share my thoughts on teaching multiplicity through radical listening. I've used a number of analog and digital pedagogic, uh, pedagogical tools to promote radical listening in the context of multidisciplinarity. Radical listening is basically a set of proactive communication strategies to listen for the roots of stories that allow for an equality between teller and listener that gives voice to the tale. Students learn to listen for motives behind the play rather than the plot of the narrative. Specifically, Radical listening draws on the methodology of strategic presentism, 
coined by Lynn Fendler, strategic presentism acknowledges the present position of the interpreters of the humanities and empowers them to make a difference by, methodol by methodically using our contemporary issues to motivate historical studies. Students connected in my class what they perceived to be King Lear's most eccentric moments, such as the division of the kingdom scene to the generational gap, crystallized by the catchphrase, OK, Boomer, which went viral after being used as a pejorative retort in 2019 by Chloe Schwabrick, a member of the New Zealand parliament in response to heckling from another member. The goal of the class was not to determine whether Lear shares characteristics of entitled boomers, but rather to use fictional situations to launch cultural criticism with room for both intellectual and emotional responses to the play. By thinking critically about the past and the present, such as colonialism or the Black Lives Matter movement, students analyze performance texts with an eye toward changing the present by foregrounding the linkage between early modern drama and contemporary ideologies in global contexts. We address the ways the past is at work in the present. In this framework, the past is not something, it's not irrelevant knowledge that is somehow sealed off from our present moment, but rather one of many complex texts to enable us to rethink the present. Since strategic presentism decenters the power structures that have historically excluded first generation students, for example, students of color or differently abled students, more students are empowered to claim ownership of the cluster of complex texts for, for analysis. The texts no longer have culturally predetermined meanings. In pedagogical practice, this means fostering connections among seemingly isolated instances of political and artistic expressions. It is paramount in a time of hate to cultivate the ability to recognize multiple potentially conflicting versions of the same story. Unambiguous, clean, and standardized singular narratives usually occur during a dark moment of history. In dramaturgical terms, this helps students discover how the same speech can be used to perform radically divergent speech acts. Instead of taking a secondary role by responding to assignment prompts, students examine the evidence as a group, annotate the text and video clips, and ask and share questions that will converge into thesis statements later. Students no longer encounter classical plays as a curated, editorialized, pre-processed narrative, but as a network of interpretive possibilities. Not only do students have multidisciplinary backgrounds, but they also speak different languages. It is productive to replace in multilingual contexts. Multilingualism turns speakers of other languages into an asset, particularly international students who are not native speakers of English. All too often, they are seen as a liability, but their linguistic and cultural repertoire should be tapped to build a sustainable intellectual community. One way to excavate the different layers of meanings is to compare versions from different parts of the world. Sometimes, in some place, there are, there's multilingualism built in. Consider these lines from Macbeth in response to the knocking on his gate shortly after he murders King Duncan. This my hand will rather the multitudinous seas in Carnadine, making the green one red, he says. The repetition of in Carnadine and red is so serendipitous, but a deliberate alternation between the Anglo-Saxon, Germanic, and the Latinate words suggest two pathways to consciousness and two perspectives on the world. Inspired by this translingual property of language, students translated scenes into other languages and explored the concept of repetitions with a difference. They will share 
uh, their translations um, back in, and in a version of English, translating key passages in a canonical English text into other languages and then reporting back in English can really diversify the class's interpretive approaches. Using the tool of version variation visualization, Tom Cheeseman directs a project along these lines called Delighted Beauty, which collects translations in more than 30 languages of just two lines from the play Othello, specifically the Duke of Venice says to Othello, if virtue no delighted beauty lack, actually he says this to Brabantio Desdemona's father uh, in reference to Othello, if virtue no delighted beauty lack, your son-in-law is far more fair than black. Reading the translations opened many cans of worms in the Duke's underhanded praise of Othello. Sharing their linguistic skills, students looked up historical translations of some plays um, and to think about some of the words that maybe uh, for native speakers they habitually gloss over. All of these exercises were built into a open access platform called Peruso. And this platform incentivizes collaboration. Peruso.com supports the annotation of text and video clips by opening up any text or web page for annotation and establish a social space where students learn from each other through the creation and circulation of free form responses to cultural texts. The interactive nature of these projects makes reading a more engaging communal experience because readers become members of a community. In this form of nonlinear thinking, the texts become part of a non-hierarchical network of ideas rather than a singular point of origin for dramaturgical meanings. Collaborative pedagogies really help us understand racialized globalization within hybrid cultural and digital spaces. Team projects also encourage students' ethical responsibility to each other as they grow from recipients of knowledge transfer to co-creators of knowledge. Here's an example. In self-selected groups, some students explore historical meanings of the word cannibal, while others launch a comparative analysis of racialized representations of Taliban in Julie Taymor's 2010 film, The Tempest, Ote Soup Korean adaptation of The Tempest, and Greg Doran's 2016 stage version of the same play. There are multiple activation points for knowledge when learning is rhizomatic and nonlinear in nature. As a result, students' experiences in class are enriched by their differentiated, individuated, and yet connected exploration. Writing and circulating rationale for dramaturgical choices led to increased awareness of one's own decision-making process. And this is known as metacognition in educational psychology. With collaborative close reading, students claim the knowledge in recognition of the speech act, rather than just the character in the sense of whether a character is relatable. Performance is an inherently communal and collaborative art form. So cooperative learning effectively reproduces the communal character of the subject while problematizing the uneven terrain of collaboration in the performing arts. The interdependent and collective nature of collaboration encourages participants' agency, sense of responsibility for their roles, and shared accountability. Multidisciplinarity is itself a productive form of collaboration. By creating knowledge collaboratively, students and educators lay claim to the ethics and ownership of that knowledge. And this is an act that is particularly urgent in the age of COVID, when students more than ever long to be connected to others during quarantine. Hatred 
as a political tool and emotional response to difference can really be resolved using the idea of multidisciplinarity. Hatred emerges at the intersection of willful ignorance and knowledgeable ignorance, the privileging of one, one singular ideology over others. One way to talk back to hate is to engage with a large number of narratives. We can raise students' awareness of multiple interpretations of the same issues. The outbreak of the global pandemic closed live theater events worldwide. But the crisis has led to a proliferation of born digital and digitized archival videos and productions in Western Europe, Canada, the UK, and the US. So this opens up many new possibilities. Well, it is feasible to teach in depth only one or two versions of a play in a given class, we can expand students' horizons by guiding them to close read multiple competing interpretations. Well, the part cannot stand in for the whole, and there, uh, while uh, the distraction is sometimes seen as a problem in education, there are actually unique advantages to distracted concentration as an intellectual exercise in research and teaching. Thank you for attending my presentation today. Feel free to follow my work at ajobin.org. Thank you and have a wonderful day.